Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the History of Humankind. In the last episode, we discussed the establishment of the world's first city at Uruk around 3200 BCE, as well as some of the Abrahamic stories from the Torah and the Old Testament of the Bible, uh, which have their origins in earlier Sumerian myths. In this episode, I want to look at the exceptional artistic innovations of the Sumerians, starting in the pre-dynastic proto-literate period between 4000 to 3100 BCE. Now, this corresponds to the Chalcolithic period when ancient peoples were experimenting with bronze and had not yet begun to use, uh, they were using copper and had not yet begun to use bronze. Um, and it may correspond to a kind of pre-Diluvian period before this so-called cataclysmic uh, flood uh, that we know of from, the, from Noah in the Bible. And then later we'll look at the early dynastic period from around 2900 to 2350 BCE. So the Sumerians were a non- Semitic people. They spoke their own language uh, and they're probably native or indigenous to the region. We don't know what Sumer means exactly, but uh, the Sumerians, they called themselves black-headed people. Black-headed people. They wore uh, sheepskin garments. For the men, it went from about their waist to down to their ankles, a kind of skirt. Women cl were more clothed, uh, but they both wore jewelry, necklaces, bracelets, and with expensive gems. Uh, the men had shaved faces, which is in stark contrast to the later Semitic conquerors, the Akkadians, who had these long, flowing, curly beards. But the Sumerians, uh, they lived in a number of city-states, around 40 in total in ancient Mesopotamia. And at the center of the city-state, you had the ziggurat, the temple complex, where um, you would give offerings to the god or goddess. And so a lot of their early artwork deals with the the offering of sacrifices and the offering of grains and whatnot. So let's start here with the Warka vase, and Warka is really the modern modern day Uruk, and it was a carved or is a carved alabaster vessel. With some of the earliest. Um, Examples of narrative relief. So it shows a scene of offering, uh, and the relief is really the, the raised part, uh, versus the, the lower, uh, sculpting right here. So you see how the, the, the figure is raised from the rest of the, the vessel. And the narrative scenes are divided into four registers. A very common feature of ancient Near Eastern art is the register. Uh, here at the bottom, you have the lowest register of vegetation, reeds around the Tigris and Euphrates. The ancient Sumerians used reeds for their canoes and for their reed huts in the marshlands. The second register here you have a procession of animals, mostly goats. The third register, uh, you have naked men bringing offerings, bowls of fruit and grain to the highest, highest register here at the temple complex with a priest and the goddess Inanna, later known as Ishtar by the Akkadians. Ishtar. So, as I said before, this vessel is very significant because of some of the earliest examples of narrative relief and these registers here with the stiff, rigid 
profile view of the figures, very similar to Egyptian art. Uh, this piece was looted from the, uh, the museum in Baghdad during the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, uh, but was later recovered, as well as the next piece we're going to look at. Here we have the Mask of Warka, sometimes called the Lady of Uruk, and it is a white marble carving, uh, probably of the goddess Inanna from around 3100 BCE, still in the pre-dynastic period. Uh, the white marble would have been too expensive to make an entire sculpture, so she probably had a wooden body at one point that hasn't survived to this day. Um, but this is a very significant piece because it is really one of the earliest representations of the human face and a very accurate one at that. She has uh, these deep-seated uh, lines um, where eyebrows would be, and they were probably inlaid with uh, lapis lazuli. And that was a, you know, a very precious gem with a rich blue coloring. And as I said before, this, this piece was looted from the museum in Baghdad during the U.S. invasion, uh, but luckily was recovered. So our next piece uh, is going to bring us to the early dynastic period, around 2900. So here we have the male worshiper which is just one of 12 alabaster figures buried uh, in what is now known as Tel Asmar in the north of Mesopotamia. So, you know, very distinct from Uruk in the south. Um, and it was probably created around 2900 to 2600 BCE. Uh, as I said, it was one of 12 sculptures, one of the smaller ones, and it was probably for votive purposes, a stand-in for human worshippers with hands clasped towards the god for the gods at all times, uh, large eyes, and as you'll see here, these deep-seated lines uh, where his eyebrows would be, probably inlaid with lapis lazuli again, like the uh, mask of Warka. It's also important to notice that he was probably of ordinary lower class standing versus uh, a king. In ancient Egyptian art, only the pharaohs and the seated scribe that you'll see later on, um, people of the higher classes were depicted in art, but here you have someone of a lower class. Next, uh, we're going to look at the Royal Cemetery at Ur. So at the Royal Cemetery at Ur, uh, which probably was created around 2650 BCE, nearly contemporary with the ruler Gilgamesh, uh, you find a number of really extraordinary pieces. Here at the bottom you have the standard of Ur, and a standard was a banner brought into war on a pole, but there's a lot of speculation as to if what its real purpose was. Uh, it could have been a music box. It could just have been a decoration for a temple. Uh, it's inlaid with lapis lazuli again. And you have the, the three registers uh, of a narrative scene. Uh, you have the lower class at the bottom in their sheepskins, bringing offerings of grain uh, and as well as in the second register here too. At the top, you have the king, who is larger than his than his retinue, and um, this is called hierarchic scale, which you'll see again in, in ancient Egypt. Here you have the higher classes drinking libations out of cups, and down here, um, the lyre player, the musician, who's playing an instrument like this one here, a kind of harp for poetry. This is really one of my favorite pieces here, and 
don't know if you can see it very well, but down here are images from the Epic of Gilgamesh, the bull's head here made of lapis lazuli and gold. Uh, the wooden uh, box had to be reconstructed, obviously. Um, let's go back to the standard of Ur, though. Uh, here you have the war scene on the other side of the box. Uh, and in the war scene, you can see some early examples of wheels, very clunky things. The spokes had not been invented yet. Uh, and once again, these rigid profile viewed uh, figures, the warriors with their helmets and long cloaks, uh, you know, ushering their slaves, their slaves from the war who are naked. And in ancient Mesopotamia, nakedness equated with death. And then finally, here to the far right, we have the ram in the thicket, made of, once again, lapis lazuli and gold. So this was a very important find. Uh, and next, we're going to look at the stele of the vultures. Finally, the stele of Aenatum. Uh, also called the stele of the vultures because of the birds up here taking away the corpses, carry on. And um, this was probably created around 2500, 2400 BCE, so definitely in the later early dynastic period, shortly before the Akkadian conquests. Uh, and it is significant because of these cuneiform inscriptions. So this is one of the earliest pieces with cuneiform inscriptions on it. Uh, which you'll see uh, the Narmer palette from ancient Egypt around 3000 BCE has uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions uh, and later on the stele of Narmer Sin from the Akkadian Empire has, um, has in, in inscriptions in it as well. And this was a limestone piece, but a large limestone piece, but it comes down to us in just in just seven fragments. It uh, commemorated the victory of King Aenatum over a neighboring city-state. So, I hope that gave you a good introduction to Sumerian art. Next time we will look at the Akkadian conquest of Sumeria and how they incorporated some of the earlier traditions into their own culture and then developed new ways of, of thinking. So thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.